So what we are talking about today in our webinar is modeling complex cable harnesses in EMA 3D simulations. I'll start off by introducing um, our company. We are Electromagnetic Applications, or EMA for short. We have a full of expert PhD level EM analysts in our company, and I've been doing this this work 39 years. We're located in Lakewood, Colorado, which is a suburb of Denver. It's a beautiful area. We'd love for you all to come and see us sometime. And we're looking for additional information about our company or what we do or trainings or information about our SIS. Please visit our website at ema3d.com. So more about EMA is that we do provide both software commercially available that you can purchase, but we also do consulting services. Our software is EMA 3D, which is a full way 3D solver, and we also have M-Harness, which is a transmission line solver for cable harnesses, and we have integrated the cable solver into our full wave solver. You can purchase or use either of these software separately or in integrated form. Tools have a very long validation heritage on real aerospace platforms. We have been doing this type of analysis with our software uh, since the 80s, and we've validated it on, on a multitude of aerospace platforms and environments, and we still do it to this day. You find that the capability of these tools compared to others are, are quite good, and what we offer is in the lowest rate of uh, for this type of tool that you'll find in the market. As well as the software tools and consulting services, we also provide expert level support for our software. And we will get back to you on the same day or help you solve your problem uh, when you are using the tools. As we own these tools and we provide consulting services, we can do custom integrations to help you solve whatever electromagnetic problem you're having. As Nils mentioned at the introduction, this webinar series is provided for free by EMA, and it's an educational series that we're trying to tackle or review topics that are pertinent or interesting to the industry. And as I mentioned before, please visit our website, ema3 ema3d.com, or feel free to contact us uh, by email. Uh, email is Cody, C-O-D-Y, at ema3d.com. Also, tuned in, Jennifer and Tim. Uh, we're all available to answer any questions you might have. So, webinar. What we're talking about today is cable harnesses. And I'm going to review some cable coupling and transient analysis techniques, how we use simulations to solve these problems, what typical certification steps when dealing with cable harnesses, how we handle these complex harnesses in our modeling approach. How, once you have imported cables, how do we simplify and assign the appropriate cable harness details to our models? And then lastly, we will talk about uh, the importance of validation and how you might validate your, your approach. So, no, cable harnesses exist in every aerospace vehicle or system. They can be quite complex and and often occur late in the design and are implemented as one of the last aspects of a particular vehicle. And these vehicles are exposed to a multitude of environments, including lightning. When dealing with cables, it would be on in the indirect effects form of lightning. And in environments, you have low levels uh, uh, coupling to these cables. And then you also have EME or EMI, EMC environments that you have to understand and evaluate yourself. System for. If you're looking at cables, you want to understand the actual transient levels. So, is what currents and voltages will couple to your cables and electronic systems? These can be analyzed so that you can verify your system, vehicle, or box functionality and safety in the presence of the different environments. So, when you're considering how to determine cable transients, there's several approaches you can take. Uh, the approach that you take will depend on the amount of time that you have, the accuracy that you need for your results, and the available information that you have on your system. So, actually, you can do simple formulas or engineering estimates. This is where you take an equation, 
plug submitters in and get a ballpark value. And so this provides a basic understanding of your problem or initial levels that you might see for your coupling transients. I start from this is a canonical or submodel. And when I canonical, I mean a simple representation of your vehicle or system that you're trying to model. And these are very good for performing parameter studies. If you change say, a conductivity of a skin, uh, you evaluate how that might affect cable transient coupling beneath that skin. And also good for evaluating uh, design features in a particular problem. If you're just looking at a, a area of your wing or an area of your radome and you want to see how adding bond straps or lightning strips uh, might impact the coupling beneath that area, you can use a, a submodel for that. Uh, the focus of this presentation and what we're going to talk about is a high fidelity model. It's where you include many details of your vehicle or platform that you're trying to analyze into a simulation model. Um, this allows you to do a full vehicle coupling analysis where you can look at many different areas in a single simulation, many different regions of your aircraft. It provides very high accuracy results that can be uh, ultimately used for certification support or a very detailed understanding of the type of coupling you might see to your vehicle. So this, I'll talk to you about uh, canonical modeling and its benefits. Uh, I'll mention that at a, a very frequent user of the simulation software, I often build canonical models to sort of do an initial understanding of a coupling problem. Um, extremely valuable in your overall analysis process. They have a very quick setup time. They simulate very quickly. As I mentioned before, they are amenable to parameter studies, and they provide a very reasonable understanding of a particular phenomenon that you're trying to study. So uh, an example of a canonical wing that I put together to look at cable transients in the leading and trailing edges. Example of a canonical model that uh, was put together to analyze cable coupling in a turf environment. It's a very simple fuselage model. And the goal of this was to change the complexity of cable harnesses to understand how adding complexities to the models change the coupling response basic level. What we found is that by doing a single wire or sort of a bulk representation of a harness, it's just not adequate to produce accurate coupling uh, results. So what we did was start with a single wire harness and couple our environment to it and look at the response and increase the complexity of that harness by adding branches, adding multiple conductors. You see it completely changes the resonance of that cable, as you might imagine, and also lowers the amplitude of coupling because of the dissipation associated with the complexities. So we went through a sequence of model features by changing the uh, variation of packing within the cable, by looking at branching, uh, sort of a standard branching, which is like a big branch, and then a micro branch, which might be a breakout at a box location. And we're combining these features. And what we found is that you can reduce the coupling levels in this canonical model by almost a factor of 100, about 40 dB, as you add complexities. So this gave us some intuition that if you want to model uh, tables in complex systems, uh, that you need to include those complexities in order to get the right answers. So now over to the high fidelity simulations. That's the main focus of this presentation and webinar. So we use high fidelity simulations to help evaluate and improve designs of particular uh, systems. You can look at how adding bond straps or um, adding activity across joints will impact your uh, transient coupling. You can, as I mentioned before, look at a complete system response of a particular vehicle. So by having details of the model in place and looking at different environments, you can analyze how coupling might be most severe in certain regions of your aircraft or what areas are most prone to um, high transient coupling. And so you can use these high fidelity models to complement a test program, or the ultimate goal is to reduce the amount of tests that you have to perform for certification purposes. So the policy guidance material, there are 
typical certification steps that a aircraft manufacturer must go through when achieving or applying or obtaining their certification for their vehicle. So what we're focusing on is electronics, cables, and systems. So in ARP 5415, which is the user's manual for certification of aircraft electrical electronic systems for direct effects of lighting, it states you can use simulation analysis to certify an aircraft for indirect effects of lightning. And what it outlines in that document is an analysis plan that, which has elements that you should include in your process for certification. And this includes outlining the analysis technique proposed. And what we're covering today is such an, out, such an analysis technique that you can use for this certification step by creating these high fidelity simulation models, you can analyze your entire system. And that's what we're proposing. Very important aspects of your plan should include key analytical model input data. This is uh, how you're obtaining parameters in your model. Where do you get the geometry from? Is it created by hand or is it imported from CAD? And what uh, parameters are you including for your conductivities, your resistances? your transfer impedances, where does that data come from? And very important for your uh, model development and certification process. Also, you have to set and show that your analysis techniques and results are valid for the particular vehicle you're trying to solve. So you have to go through a validation effort to do so. And you must understand the sensitivity of your model and technique to variation of parameters is very good um, for simulations that you can tweak parameters in your model and simulate recite at a, a very efficient manner to understand the sensitivity of your model to those variations and you must define then based on your validation and uh, sensitivity exploration margins that are associated with your numerical analysis the thing I'll point out is that in the advisory circular 20-136B for protection of aircraft electronic systems against indirect effects, it specifically states that you may use aircraft analysis to determine ATLs. And see ARP 5415 for guidance. Uh, the acceptance of the analysis method you choose depends on the accuracy of your method. So it's cool that you go through that validation effort. And anytime you're doing an or a program for certification, you must uh, do this with your Cognizant ACO to make sure that you're all on the same page for your certification. For our high fidelity models, um, we have used in the past and recommend using many companies, uh, rec many companies use this type of analysis for their certification program. Uh, one of the hurdles in the past has been being able to implement complex cable systems in a full vehicle. It has taken a long time. Uh, we have found these results to be very accurate and very valuable, valuable for the, uh, the integrators. With our tools that we have available, EMA 3D with integrated M harness, you can model your entire vehicle to individual pin transients in single simulation. So typical steps that we use for high fidelity models. We will measure or determine the structural material properties or cable transfer impedances. Um, these are key inputs from the analysis plan discussed before. And then also do the importation and preparation of geometry for our CEM simulation. Now, this determining of uh, key inputs can be done in parallel with the preparation of model simulation. So you have your basic structural uh, representation of your vehicle. You have to define your cable harnesses in uh, detailed form from interconnect drawings and, and cable schematics. And when incorporated all that information into your model, then you simulate and determine transients on cables. And you can determine for test purposes uh, which 160 waveform and levels are appropriate for your uh, particular electronics boxes. You might determine some key model inputs are very important for your accuracy of your model or through some kind of measurement program. Um, this is something that EMA can 
also perform what we have done in many programs to uh, analyze the types of materials that are being uh, input into the particular vehicle we're analyzing, and we can measure and quantify the conductivities associated with complex composite stacks in the presence of ECF or without, and also characterize uh, factor impedance associated with critical joints in those particular designs. So these things that you need to know um, with, with very accuracy as model inputs for your high fidelity models. To start out with a CAD import process, where you use your manufacturing CAD data that's supplied by your structural engineers and um, other engineers, and we import that into our CAD preprocessor. And then we'll prepare all of the um, structures and interfaces in that model for CEM simulation. And it includes both the exterior components, outer mold line, as well as the interior components that are critical, which includes cables, um, <clears throat> your ionics boxes, your engines, your bulkheads, things that would impact your coupling transients. So what's done in, in recent years is sort of simplify the modeling of, of cables. Uh, we have some automated approaches now to simplify cables from an imported CAD. And we have a wizard that's available, I'll show a demonstration today, of how you can rapidly specify cable harness details based on your wiring information. And we can also co-simulate your harness model, your transmission line model, with the 3D simulations to resolve all the details of your branches, shields, and conductors. I have a, a video showing how we would take an imported CAD for cable harnesses and simplify it for our uh, Let's see here. If I play, just give me a moment. There we go. Apparently, you can have the laser pointer on and click play at the same time. What now is just showing the imported geometry of the aircraft that we will be looking at for for, for analysis. Um, look inside, you can see the imported electronics boxes and cables. Obviously, it's a simplified version and is not meant to be uh, exactly duplicate any particular aircraft or design. This is for educational purposes only. Um, we look in, we can see that there. Uh, connections of cables to electronics boxes in the mid portion of the aircraft and also in the avionics or forward portion of the aircraft. We're going to go through and reduce these uh, imported cables to uh, lines that we would typically use for our harness definition. It would take quite a long time. And as you can see, as I select now, you see that multiple bodies are often used to represent cable harnesses that are imported as they bind the sections, and these bodies can link up with other sections to form branches in a cable harness. In order to put the necessary information into our finite difference model, uh, we have to sort of reduce these bodies to a single line that we can apply our, our uh, transmit line characteristics to. And so what we do um, is with a tool that we have, it's our cable simplify tool. And what you can do is enter a set name or identify the cables that you're going to use for this analysis, and basically hit go, and it's going to create simplified representations of all these imported cables. Uh, look at the left side here, uh, and look at the entire aircraft for, for uh, simple purposes necessary information and hit go. It's computing the center lines for all of those bodies um, that have for your original imported cables. Uh, for now, of information that we have here would take about 10 minutes to go through and produce all of these simplified lines, which is relatively quick uh, automation process. But I've skipped ahead here to the point where all simplifications are finished. And now let's look at the, these uh, simplified representations that we have. 
the simplified cables to the plot, you can see they very nicely overlay um, the original routing of the cables. This is important to maintain this routing um, because as you move your cables away from your structures in your vehicle, it can affect the coupling. And if you have intersections of your cables with your structures, it's, it can uh, produce unwanted results. So this is a nice way to simplify you know, CAD without oversimplifying it. And it's very good for our definition process. So the video is done. We'll move along now. So you have your routing or geometrical representation of your cables in your model. You have to assign the appropriate um, beat of that cable to your wires. And types of things that you need are the type of wire that you're looking at. Is it a shielded twisted pair? Is it a coax? Is it an unshielded wire? You need to understand the gauge of the wire, um, detonation and impedances associated with your cables, and circuit loads that you want to include in your analysis. Oftentimes for uh, ATL analysis, you're looking at the most case, which is commonly referred to as the open circuit voltage or the short circuit current. So in cases, we will ignore the actual circuit loads in the electronics box, and we'll either short the cable on, on both ends or short it on one and leave it open on the other to determine the short circuit current and open circuit voltage. Uh, something you would need to know are some shield properties, uh, transfer impedance associated with the, the shields that you're using. Now, a lot of, it can be a lot of information to gather when putting together a model. Um, and we have tried to do our best to help out in the sense that we have a database of information for uh, distances, diameters, uh, transfer impedances that we have measured or determined on our own uh, for typical type aerospace cables. You still have to go through the process of determining which cables are in your design, but we have in our tools a uh, stored database of information for different types of cables that we have in the most cases measured our so I'll go through a demonstration of how you might end those features to your cables. So for this is called the M Harness Wizard. And so it's a tutorial uh, GUI that walks the user through the necessary inputs in order to create a, a workable transmission model. And again, this transmission line model can be run integrated with your full 3 model or separately with the M harness solver. So we put together a model. I'll just show you real quick. This is what we call a configuration control document. This is where we keep track of all the different components in our model and snapshots of it, and then we keep track of the type of material associated with it, the conductivity of that material, thickness of it, and what assumptions we use in our model, what kind of connectivity we use to represent that component in our model. It's a very quick way for a non-CAD user to see what's in the model. We we'll also do this for our cables. So this is a simplified representation here of what our cable information might be like in our vehicle. Right down into several different cables, showing the name of it, the, the gauge of the wire, the type of the cable that will be used, and as well as the number of cables of that type in a particular bundle. So for demonstration, I'm just going to focus on one of the cables. Um, and to input this information that we have here, based on routing, connection, uh, wire type, into our cable model. For that, we will open up our M Harness Wizard, which is in our, our uh, M cable section number nine of our toolbox. Here is the tutorial. So basically it says that we have stored data in our tool, uh, resistances, diameters, transfer impedances, and you are welcome to use that, and we feel it's a good representation of actual cables, but if you have measured data or a different type of cable, you should put that in for your parameters. So I guide you through some basic steps. What, what cable are you working with? What level shielding do you have for your cable? Do you have an overbraid with cable shields and interconductors, or do you just have like TSPs where you have cable shields and conductors, or are there no shields at all? So this is something you need to be aware of going into your definition. 
And then because we have one level of shielding, there are a couple of ways to model this in our software. You can model it as overbraids and cable shields where you're neglecting the interconductors, or you model it as cable shields and core wires, which is more typical. And we're going to be looking at cable shields and core wires for this definition. Now what I'm asking you to do is go through and identify uh, the sequence of routing that you might use for your particular cable. And just input the set that has all your lines and click uh, return to add that information. Or you can select the individual lines that you want to use for your uh, initial cable definition. Just focusing on one cable for this definition for the uh, sake of demonstration, but you can define as many cable harness definitions as you want with this tool in a single shot, or you can do it with a, a multiple, uh, multiple through this wizard. For a naming convention, uh, you can input your complex cable names that are often associated with your harnesses. I don't know what come up with these names, but they are often very lengthy and, and awkward to deal with. For our analysis purposes, it doesn't matter what that name is so long as we have the right information for that harness. So I prefer to call them by simple segment names, uh, broken down in a sequential fashion that just makes more sense to me. You have the option to automatically name these, or you can input every harness name uh, you want for your definition. Now to go through and tell it how many, how many conductors we expect to have in our first harness that we're looking at. At any point, if you put in the wrong number or need to change it, you can do so. There's nothing that allows you to do that. Um, but for this analysis, I'm going to use 24 cables. So, so this is our overall harness. The harness has several branches, as you can see. But the individual cables only route from one box to another box. So they use certain segments of that overall harness branching. So what we'll do is tell it where the box, uh, which sections are for this first cable. And according to my spreadsheet, it says that it connects from an avionics box to a wingtip light. So I've selected the cables that route from my avionics box to my light. And you can see it highlights those lines showing where the routing is of that particular cable. Now I get to define what type of cable it is. So this is a gauge that you can select anywhere from 26 down to double gauge. And of course, you can put in any other information that you might have on it. And then also you need to select the type of cable. Is it a coax cable? PSP. In this case, we're assuming it's a quadrex cable, so it's a shield with four um, inner pins. And as I mentioned before, we have stored data for the type of cable, uh, including shield radius, resistance, transfer inductance, as well as the internal conductor wire radius and resistances. Now, of course, you can use this information that we have, which we feel is a good representation of typical aerospace cables, or you can input your own. After you have defined the type of cable, you need to specify the loads or termination um, impedances associated with your interconductors. For this analysis, we're assuming it's all short circuit, it's all resistive with a very low resistance is how we implement that. We have these cable types, these gauge quadracks that go from the onyx box to light, or two of them, sorry. So I'm going to make a copy of that cable is what we did in that process. Now to the next type a 20 gauge unshielded wire. So find the routing for this particular cable. Select the, the uh, lines that are used as routing. Determine points of this particular uh, shield or cable. And use a, a typical 2.5 milliohm resistance for uh, for the nation. And then also here adjust the cable type and gauge. So there is no shield information for this unshielded wire, which are oftentimes routed with twisted shielded pairs or other things. And we'll say OK for that bundle. Oh, I'm sorry, for that particular cable. And we have four total of these. So I'll make three additional copies that have the same routing and termination characteristics. And the next cable and specify its termination and routing position. So it's, um, it's it does take some time to put this information in, but but generally it's easy about cables. 
What this allows you to do is to simplify the imported CAD and then also very clearly select the termination and routing locations of your cable and give it specific properties associated with typical aerospace cables. And they're designed to do. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit because what we'll be doing is repeating this selection of routing uh, and specification of cable type parameter information. So I'll skip ahead a little bit and, and find, we've defined most of our cables. Of 24, this is 23 of 24. You can see across the top of the screen of the harness GUI, and what's the final termination point? So two uh, TST, twisted shielded triplet in this case. Again, we're using shorted connectors and conductors, and have one more copy that we're going to define. And then if you've defined all of your cable routing and features, you can look at the packing of the individual segments. So this is segment one. You can look at how you want to configure the conductors within your packing arrangement. And this cable pack tool allows you to modify the arrangement if you see fit. The conductors around and position them in any uh, arrangement that you feel is necessary. It's hard to know exactly what arrangement to put them in because the packing is not controlled typically in installations of vehicles. Sometimes it's quite random, and if we're trying to do an analysis, what we typically do is make sure that we have a particular cable type along the exterior of that harness bundle to sort of look at what the uh, severe coupling might be for that particular cable type. Um, this, also, this tool also provides you the ability to define probes. If you want to add voltages or currents on any conductor or segment, I'm just going to define one shield, one current, uh, and that's essentially it. So now we've created our input file, and we've completed our definition of routing and cable properties for this harness that we're looking at. So now we've defined our harness properties, we'll assume we've also defined all our material parameters for the rest of our vehicle and ready for simulation. Um, for this one, I'm going to show we did a nose strike for this aircraft and a left elevator detach in the Anaj uh, region. And what I want to point out is that with our analysis technique is that we can solve these problems faster than ever before. Everybody knows that the processors and computer memory are increasing. Um, they do. And we also have the ability to do a parallelized computing. This can be done on cluster computers, but also on desktops. Um, this simulation was performed on my desktop computer, which has 16 cores, and it was done in a parallel fashion and completed in about eight hours, which is incredible for this size of problem to be able to be analyzed on a desktop computer. It just hasn't been able to be in that fashion before. And a 50 millimeter mesh size was used, and it had 280 million cells. And it's a seven gigabyte problem. So you have a very nice desktop to do that, uh, but it can be done on desktops. And one feature that I'll point out is that we have a, a uh, skin technique in our software, which is called the gradual permittivist scaling. And that's um, applicable in, in low frequency analysis problems, which lighting can be at later times, why you increase the permittivity of your problem space gradually and can adjust the time step of your problem in a similar fashion in order to achieve greater time steps at later times. Um, and it works very well for lightning applications. So this, this huge aircraft model looking at indirect effects of lightning, uh, normally, I mean, it's hard to say normally, it really depends on the type of computer you've had and what you're analyzing, but it, would, it could take a long time to analyze this problem. Now it can be done overnight if you set the situation to go overnight, you come in in the morning, and you have results. It's, it's quite amazing. This model, I set up probes to look at different ATLs that you might be interested in for a couple, uh, cable coupling. 
And so I looked at bundle currents, short circuit pin currents, open circuit pin voltages. And so for an entire aircraft model, including the details of the cable harnesses, we can look at a short circuit pin transient in the simulation. And I probed many more cables in this analysis, but I'm not going to go through all the, the, the results here for the sake of time. But you can gather data for your entire aircraft in a single simulation. And if you're clever about the way you process that data, you can make nice um, sheets or tables that can quickly allow the analyst to see worst case, worst case transients occur. And if you perform a matrix of simulations, considering different attachment and detachment locations, you can quite uh, efficiently analyze uh, what configuration, what attachment detach case you have, which transients will be the most severe. And this is a very uh, convenient way to set your DL160 test levels uh, that you have to do for system verification purposes. And along with any waveform that can produce for cable transient structural currents, we have a, a lot of uh, visualization tools that, that show you for your configuration, current densities, uh, sections of electric or magnetic fields, um, and that you might want to look at visually can be produced. This includes animations that we uh, that showed a bit earlier in the uh, presentation. So for this, you can see that we did, in fact, strike the nose and take it off of the uh, left elevator tip. So you have your results. This noise comes up as how accurate are those results? Um, I showed in some examples, if you oversimplify your problem, you have misleading or wrong answers. Um, so everybody always asks, well, how accurate do I need to be? And that really depends on your program. If you're just looking for uh, estimates of answers or if you're using it for a certification type, you will have to go through a more detailed validation effort to determine how accurate your simulation technique is to experimental configuration. And so we have done this on many aerospace platforms, and we have, over the years, seen an excellent agreement between um, all different time domain simulation software uh, and analysis technique with the experimental side of things. That is when you do a correlation between your simulation and experiment as it allows you to set your simulation margins. This is where you can apply an uncertainty to simulation and give a high confidence that your results are within this particular uh, margin. There are techniques and formulas available to do a detailed quantification of your correlation. There's the uh, FSV, Fear Selective Validation Technique, where you can look at um, attitudes and uh, integrals to, to come up with a quantitative error value. This is not well defined. There are some suggestions in papers or publications that are available, but it's not defined in any standard. The IEEE standard for CEM validation does not cover lightning transients very well. Um, it's being updated uh, currently that the task group is looking at on ways to incorporate uh, uh, of lightning for this validation. But what we have done historically and recently is to look at peak value comparison of experimental data and simulation data to get a um, sort of a uh, overall correlation in that manner, and then look at a visual inspection of waveforms to see if they are, are similar. And, and this type of Validation has been published recently for uh, various aircraft certification programs, and what we have found is just what we consider an extraordinary correlation, correlation between experiment and simulation. That you can see the tab in the lower right that 95% of our simulation peak values were within 6 dB of the experimental results. So we often speak in terms of dB. So for 6 dB, when looking at currents and voltages, that would be a factor of two, and we dug a little deeper and found that more than 80% of our question results were within 3 dB. So this, you can see that chart in the upper right-hand corner, with the red line being where experiment and simulation are equivalent. That through a large range of amplitudes, from 10 amps up through 10 milliamps, there is very good or very sort of tight correlation between our simulation results and our experimental results and found this level of correlation to be applicable on multiple vehicles in multiple environments. 
uh, and we have confidence that we can reproduce this on, um, on programs and vehicles. The type of validation effort you might need to go through. You set up a, a experimental object and simulate the same thing and then go through a data analysis to achieve your simulation margins. So here's a, a one, here's one final example. So that validation uh, effort we were referring to, we looked at an entire vehicle uh, correlate where we simulated indirect effects of lightning and they actually performed indirect effects of lightning tests on that. And so Initially, we had modeled some of the cables using a bulk representation, where we captured the approximate diameter and approximate resistance of those cables. We found a larger than acceptable discrepancy in our results, around 90 B. And at that time, we decided to go back and incorporate uh, the more detailed information of the harness. So from a bulk representation to uh, a detailed harness model, and we saw just by changing that representation of the cable, we saw a very uh, improved correlation between the simulation and experimental results down within 3 dB. Uh, for the need to represent the complexities of your cable harnesses, both the interconnector details and the appropriate branching associated with the harness in order to achieve accurate results. What I've reviewed in this webinar are some different analysis techniques. I talked briefly about engineering estimates and how you can create canonical or submodels. But the main focus was on these high fidelity uh, vehicle models. And easier than ever to import and develop and include the full complexity of cable harnesses in for your analysis. And we have in our validation heritage high confidence in the ability of these full vehicle simulations to produce accurate transient levels in your particular vehicle. Um, and I tried to show uh, through those demonstrations that we have tools available that more rapidly allow the simplification of cables from an you know, import and also definition of parameters for those harnesses you um, harness wizard. That's what I have for you guys today. I really appreciate everybody tuning in. In. Uh, we now will answer some questions that anybody would have, and uh, please feel free to contact me directly on my email, Cody at EMA3D.com, or on my phone, direct line, 720-974-1208. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions about what you've seen or heard today. Thank you all very much. As you said, we're open for questions now, so if, uh, if there's anything you'd like answered, feel free to type it into the uh, Q&A box, and we'll stick around for just a little bit and answer anything that anyone has. Questionnaire. Uh, what are the limitations of this tool? I, I'm not quite sure to answer that question. Now we have the ability to model an entire vehicle and include details of uh, many different cable harnesses into that full vehicle. So as far as limitations go, we can include an incredible amount of de uh, detail for a particular aircraft into our link approach. Um, the more specific question limitations. Volume of the body of the airplane. So finite difference time domain, you can we have the ability to by adjusting our cell size to cure um, any aerospace vehicle that is out there. We have done some extremely large aerospace vehicles meshing at a a pinch level, and those requirements do uh, the necessities of that size of a model require us to have a a larger computing capacity. But we have cluster compute available to incorporate all the necessary details and size of, of 
those very large um, vehicles. Size gigabytes, 10 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes. Yes, if your computer can handle uh, that as a problem, our model can be developed for that. As I showed this particular model, um, let's see if I back up. I think it's about 11 gigabytes in size, and I was able to run it on my desktop. Now, I do have a, a rather nice desktop. I think I have 120 gigabytes memory available, um, but I could run a 100 gigabyte problem and use the uh, speed up techniques we have parallelized computing and gradual permittivity scaling. Um, it can run faster than ever before. I got a, um, another question for you. Uh, it says, how would you go about characterizing a composite aircraft in your analysis? It's like measured data is required for the model. What kind of measured data is required? It's a good question. And so, oftentimes what we do is we go through a, a panel measurement program where based on a generic panel size, say 16 inches or 20 inches, we will connect electrodes up to each side and do conductivity characterization of that particular um, configuration. So I know there are many different ways to lay up your composite panels, or plies, and different epoxies that can be used. And what we can do is apply um, either DC currents, or we can actually use lightning level currents. We have a, a generator here at our laboratories that can get up to a few kiloamps and we can use that to analyze the conductivities that should be input for your model parameters. And at the same time, we can also look at uh, what, what, what is also critical for model parameterization is the impedances of your joints. Uh, so you imagine if you have, have a very high resistance or poor joints at locations, it could uh, in, induce larger coupling to your cables or equipment that's below those joints. So we also have the ability to characterize fastener impedances. So when I say fastener impedance, I mean a contact resistance between your installed fastener and the surrounding composite or materials, which we can then um, implement as a seam or a joint into our model. So the things that we would characterize are the conductivity associated with your composite panel, and that includes the whether or not it has ECF or other lightning strike protection material on top of it, and then it's contact to the fasteners for a joint or seam uh, characterization. Thank you for the, um, one more question. You show the process for analyzing a lightning strike. How do you set up an antenna to show the results of HERF testing? So uh, what we might do for that, so for HERF testing, uh, what I showed is some HERF results for low-level swept coupling uh, on cables, LLSC. I'm going to look at the antenna response for HERF simulation. You need to consider uh, the cavity that you're looking at, the antenna placement, and also the data processing. So whenever they do data analysis for HERF testing, they have some kind of data processing. You know, they have different bandwidths that they sample at. They have different data. Uh, that they do in their sampling, and you should try and filter your data from your simulation in a similar manner to what they have or what they typically do uh, for HERF testing. Point out, like I said before, but once you have a model, a high fidelity model, you can analyze it for multiple environments. So, and do lightning sort of direct effects, lightning indirect effects. You can look at HERF. Now, of course, the, the cell size is a limiting factor for the frequency that you can go to in HERF analysis. But with a one-inch model, we can go up to a gigahertz, which is plenty high for analyzing low-level swept fields and low-level swept currents in the uh, HERF analysis realm. So I see a question, is it, is it possible to use mesh geometry as an input for your model? 
for example, a mesh use for structural analysis with some, adjust, uh, with some adjustments. Um, I think that would be possible. So if you have some geometrical representation of your vehicle and you want to bring it over, so long as there is some entities like surfaces or um, uh, components I think we could do, we can convert that into a finite difference model. We would just have to read mesh that uh, rep geometric representation using our finite di difference meshing approach. We do have a, uh, a large amount of import capabilities. So any, any CAD native format that you're dealing with uh, should be able to import. CATIA, PROE, um, the one you can think of, as well as generic files such as STEP, IGES, uh, and, and those types of formats. A few more. There's another question here. Uh, what is the maximum frequency range limit for the simulation tool? So the frequency range limit for finite difference is determined by your cell size. Um, so typically you want to be able to resolve about, uh, you want to resolve one wavelength of your uh, field, you want about 10 cells to do so. And do the, the computation for that. If you're dealing with a one inch or 25 millimeter cell size, that comes to about one gigahertz. So if you want to go higher in frequency, you need to use a lower cell size. And if you're looking at high frequency applications, then the finite difference time domain technique isn't really uh, suited for those higher frequency applications. We do have other uh, analysis techniques and software that we're familiar with that can go to higher frequency of course, but this particular approach is not well suited for that. All right, uh, sums up all the questions at, at least on my side. So, um, anyone else, no other questions that you're seeing, Cody, I think we'll wrap this up. All right, that's it. And if, any, if you do have questions or like to discuss any of these topics or other electromagnetic topics, please uh, contact us. You can send me an email, visit our website, you can call me, uh, and we'll be able to, to have discussions on it. Again, everybody for attending and, and please, uh, attend other webinars as we have them going forward. And if you have any suggestions for webinars, uh, please let us know.